Well, welcome everybody. And uh, it's a lovely evening here in London, but we've got some great scenes to show you in a few minutes when we see our guest, Francois, and his background. My background is of Francois, of course, because we have a big, big issue, don't we? We have a big green issue, and we are doing lots of things about it, I hope. And I really hope we have your support to do those things. Well, here in London, we are uh, working on uh, many events during this week, which is Great Big Green Week. And there are more than 300 events, I believe, happening in London. But I'm hoping that you're going to some of them, and I'm trying to go to some of them as well. But especially glad that you're here for this one. My name is Durham. I'm chairman of the BCS Central London and North London branches. Great groups of people. If you're not a BCS member, do come and join us. You can join us anybody for free for this event, but do come and join us in the BCS if you possibly can. I recommend it. But as well as all of these things in London, of course, there's a whole world of effort that we need and the whole world needs everybody's effort, as well as all of the pandemic problems and numerous other things that we're going through. We need to save. <coughs> and this is really, really important, isn't it? Well, I hope you have got all of the um, uh, tools, the information you need relating to what you can do to help with environmental conservation. But you can see the screen there. You can see we have a great event for you this evening. And our speaker, Francois Joel, is here with us now. I mentioned about all the things that are happening in London. But of course, it's not only in London, is it? It's around the world. And I know that Francois has been recently to Marseille and has been um, at a global conference there. Well, as far as Francois is concerned, he is, of course, our main attraction for this evening. But additionally, we have our colleague, Santana Lewis, who is the lead for our eco initiative. And we also have colleagues from BCS Green IT Specialist Group, which Santana is also a member of. And we will have five minutes at the end of this session for Santana to tell us about some of the other eco initiatives which are of particular relevance to us today and tomorrow. So you will see Santana speak later, but meanwhile, please join me in welcoming Francois Jol. Francois, over to you and that fabulous background. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Talim. I will share my screen so you can all see the, the, the nice slide uh, that I've prepared for you. I hope it's all showing properly for you. Can you hear me all good? Can you see yeah. everything all good? Perfect. So uh, thanks for inviting me, uh, Dalim. Uh, yes, we just been at our major event in Marseille, which, which is called the World Conservation Congress. I will talk a bit about it in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, today I will discuss more what are the challenges, opportunity to be CIO in a very large environmental body. And uh, first, I want to quickly share uh, with you uh, who I am just that you know. So I'm the CIO and Director of Global Information Systems at IUCN. Uh, I have a career uh, across multiple organizations uh, before arriving in this position. And I'm also involved with quite a lot of uh, small startups, uh, which are linked also to sustainable uh, usage of technology. Uh, who is IUCN? Uh, generally, we are an organization not very well known uh, because we are a bit in the background. We, I will say we are the B2B organization for environmental, but in fact, we are the world's 
largest global environmental organization. Uh, we were founded in 1948 in Fontainebleau uh, near Paris and uh, directly our seat was near Geneva, uh, like close to the United Nations. You may, most of you know WWF. Uh, WWF was part of IUCN at the beginning and was the uh, World Wildlife Fund and was uh, more B2C NGO uh, part of IUCN, which split it from IUCN because IUCN is not an NGO. Uh, we are a, a non-profit uh, organization and we are unique in the fact that we are a platform uh, democratic platform which basically integrates states, government agencies, NGOs, indigenous people, member organizations located in 160 countries around the world. Uh, we are the leading provider of latest knowledge about biodiversity uh, and we include more than 18,000 experts and scientists providing this uh, knowledge. Uh, we are the only environmental organization with official observer status at the United Nations General Assembly, which is happening these days in New York, and we are considered the voice of nature at the UN. Our vision is written here, it's a just world that values and conserves nature, and the mission is also, I won't repeat it, but it's really uh, sometimes a different mission than you can see to more strictly ecological. We want to have basically a good life for people uh, using natural resource in an equitable and ecologically sustainable way. So I want for that to, uh, to share with you today uh, a video which explain to you a little bit better uh, who IUCN is. So I hope you can find and I will put myself on mute. Uh, I hope you can uh, hear the video, see it, and I will continue after the video. How much do you love nature? Do you remember your first walk in a forest? Your first swim in the ocean? the first time you saw a wild animal. We all love nature. We all depend on nature. More than 40% of the world's oxygen comes from rainforests. 50% of chemical medicines are based on nature. percent of our food comes from nature. Are we taking this for granted? We need nature to sustain us. IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, is the world's largest global environmental network created in 1948. Together, we're working in more than 160 countries for a just world that values and conserves nature. With over 1,000 staff, more than 1,200 member organizations, including governments and NGOs, and almost 11,000 volunteer scientists and experts. Together, we gather the latest knowledge on biodiversity, assessing the status of species, and protecting our natural wonders. We run hundreds of field projects around the world, such as managing water resources, restoring forests, protecting our coasts and oceans and helping companies improve their environmental performance. We are nature's voice on the international stage at the IUCN World Conservation Congress, at the United Nations General Assembly, 
at international environmental negotiations. By investing in solutions offered by nature, we can address today's global challenges. Together, we can stop the extinction of plants and animals. Help fight climate change. Restore natural resources. Boost food security. And reduce poverty. When nature is healthy, our communities, economies and countries prosper. Together, let's stand up for nature to create a better future for all of us. Join us now. So thank you for your attention on this movie. It explained a little bit better IUCN. What I can say is uh, IUCN is a very powerful union and it's, uh, as I mentioned, it was mentioned in the, in the little video, uh, we have a very special organization. Uh, IUCN is con composed of four bodies. Uh, myself and all my colleagues, our staff are part of the secretariat and uh, we are located with 11 regions, 50 country project offices, and we have a headquarter in Glan uh, near Geneva in Switzerland. You can see here on the right all the regional offices and outposted office from HQ. We run project, a project portfolio of about 600 million uh, in, uh, in this year, but Secretariat is just basically serving the members. The members here on the left, uh, they're organized in uh, regional and national committees. They are composed, as it was mentioned, we have increased since the video. We are nearly 1,400 organizations now with 200 government, 1,200 NGOs and indigenous people. We, we also regroup uh, a lot of people in commissions. Uh, and the commission, we have six commissions, they are listed here on various important topics like education, like law, protected areas, species survival commission. And this commission composed of volunteers. A lot of people are working themselves in universities or are scientists in other organization, but they contribute to the knowledge of the organization. And on top are 36 elected councillors representing the council, which is the governing body of IUCN. Uh, you can see here on the right all the projects that we run. Uh, some of them uh, looks like centered in Switzerland. These ones are global projects. They may have in fact impact in all the other countries, but uh, they are basically listed in uh, at HQ in this map. So we are truly a global organization and uh, we contribute really through to the conservation of nature through four basic processes. And as you can see, uh, it starts to show the need for IT. First, data, knowledge and tools. As mentioned in the video, IUCN is the global authority on the status of natural world and all the measures needed to safeguard it. And as such, we collect a lot, a huge amount of data. We are a science-based organization. We base on numbers and we consolidate this data information and tools into components that are essential to the nature conservation and sustainable development. Many people know the IUCN red list of threatened species. It's the reference. It's even used as part of the United Nations uh, Sustainable yeah. Development Goals to measure the evolution of nature. We also have protected planets here, which is uh, a list or an inventory of all uh, protected areas across the world. Ecolex is for database of laws for ecology, environmental. And we also collect all the key biodiversity areas. Once we have this, and we have many more, these are just an extract. 
uh, once we have the data, we produce a lot of analysis uh, to basically provide not only data, but also knowledge for decision makers. Once we have these analysis, we have basically, we convene, uh, it used to be physically, but now we have moved into more hybrid modes. So we have the, the beauty of IUCN, it's a neutral forum. It's also a reason why it has been based in Switzerland. And the uh, IUCN World Conservation Congresses happen every four years. And I'm just out of the latest one, uh, which was in Marseille in uh, the last, the first two weeks of September. Uh, it was postponed by one year due to COVID, but uh, it ends up being uh, organized still with a big part physically face-to-face -face in Marseille, but we improve with a lot of IT systems and that was a big challenge to get it into the hybrid mode. Uh, the previous one was in Hawaii and before it was in Jeju. This Congress are uh, basically organized uh, like Olympic Games. We have candidates, they are selected and one is the winner. And we are just starting the process to, uh, for the next Conservation Congress, which will happen in four years from now. We also convene through various multi-stakeholder agreements I mentioned a few here. Uh, we are the uh, convener of the Aluminium Stewardship Initiative. We are also part of the Natural Capital Coalition and many others. And then all this leads to action on the ground. Uh, as I mentioned, we have nearly 600 million Swiss francs of projects in the pipe. Uh, it's split into 350 field projects around the world also um, managed and developed in 160 countries and basically to develop and implement the policies, the laws and all the best practices we develop for conservation of development. And from this project, it provides basically lessons and, and data, which basically is <clears throat> entered into our data and the cycle continues. So this is really the way we operate and as you can see, it's a lot with data and systems. Our priorities are threefold at IUCN and they are fully aligned behind, uh, behind uh, how do you say, part of the 17 uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Uh, we're also part of all the COPs and we were of course at Paris 2015 and at soon the COP26, which will be in the UK. In Glasgow. Uh, we were also part of the 2020 Aishi biodiversity targets and now we are part of the post-2020 uh, agenda and the 2030, the Nature 2030 uh, agreements and uh, we are all there to basically ensure that not only we set the targets but we put also measures in place to measure how we grow and how we go into reaching those targets. As you can see, since 1948, we had seven decades of vision and impact. The red list we were in advance on many of the uh, many of the problems that are today on the table as priorities. Uh, the first IUCN red list was published in 64. In 1960, we identified climate change as an emerging challenge, and uh, also in 1978. The categories protected area management was adopted. So we have a lot in 2012, we launched the idea what's called nature-based solutions, which is a big idea now taken over by most of the UN and many of the other organizations. So we are at the beginning. We also make uh, progress on the, to advance international conservation laws through various, again, multi-stakeholder platforms. This is a bit of a simplification of how we work. <clears throat> we have our members on the left and on the middle, we have basically the staff and our experts which collaborate uh, to basically influence and action uh, policy and direct benefit to people on nature. And we also give direct benefits back to the members so the members can also participate in attaining the SDG and meeting other global challenges. So this is the way we operate. And of course, as you have seen now in this whole con concept of IUCN, 
IS uh, has to be at the core. And I was hired in 2014 to basically deploy a new IS strategy. In the past, IS was seen as more, uh, how do you say, a supporting function, but not as a basic function to help the organization move and advance the agenda of conservation. Since 2014, we are more realigned with the business. We ensure from an IS perspective, alignment with the organization's strategy. Everything we do now is directly linked with the way our business. And in every Congress, we got a four-year plan and program, and IT is not part of the plan and program of IUCN. It used that technology was not included. Now we managed to get technology in. We also see that uh, the funding sources have changed and has an impact on our IS uh, financing. The project work is increasing a lot. And what is reduced is what we call framework donors. Framework donors are people who give money just for IUCN to operate. And fortunately, this part is going down. And project work on the other side, which shows real results and shows real uh, impact on the ground has increased tremendously. Now, of course, we get money part of the project work, but this change forces us to see differently how we operate and how we manage IT. We also, part of this project work increase was because we got certified from very big donors. GEF, which is the Global Environmental Facility, GCF, the Green Climate Fund, and the European Union are really, really important donors now. And the big change with them is they now require full traceability in all what we do finance, project management, etc. We also changed our workforce. That was a big change. We hire, I would say, younger people. We hire people which have more technology, which are more technology savvy. And so if you hire these people, they want more collaboration. And so we at IUCN have started and worked in the past around silos because of the way we were structured. And so we have to change the structure. We have to, we need to collaborate more. And of course, IT is a key part of this collaboration. We also have something which come with the increased visibility and increased funding regarding project is uh, hackers are also have more uh, increased interest with IUCN. And so we have seen in recent times, a big increase in threats and when we have major event like the Congress in Marseille, we see also uh, this uh, increase of threats. Of, and so we have now prepared ourselves to be uh, ready. And so I'm happy to say during the Congress, we didn't have any uh, security issues. And then the last one, the business driver is we also at IUCN need to walk our talk. Uh, so we need to ensure from an IT perspective, we need to ensure all operations are green, all operations are also uh, sustainable. And so we have changed a bit the way we select partners, the way we use systems, as well as how we prioritize projects. So uh, we basically decided to drive more efficiencies to address the funding issues. We wanted to digitize really our IUCN processes uh, and also look at in this, this digitization, we also look at the impact on the environment of many of our process. You will be surprised before we run this project or this program, uh, how many DHL and how many paper-based processes we still had. So we prioritize all of that to reduce a lot of the paperwork. And if I take, for example, the Congress, which is a good example, in 2012 in Jeju, Korea, the Congress printed about 3 million pages in about 10 days. In Hawaii, we implemented the first, uh, I will say, no paper or less paper Congress. We came from 3, 000, 3 million sorry, to 30,000. And the number I got from Marseille, which was the last this year, where everything was electronic, 
uh, we came down to about five to six thousand pages. So we have reduced a lot uh, of paper, a lot of printer, a lot of electricity. And we also procure a lot of uh, equipment, which we probably do scrutiny uh, and uh, due diligence on the suppliers. We also started to enable more data gathering and analysis, especially coming from innovative sources. I mentioned just a few here. And as I mentioned, we uh, through the AI strategy, we wanted to increase the security of our environment. Now, most people talk about cyber security, but in our case, and you will see later, we also have issues with physical security. And the context is, and one of the specialty of IUCN is, we often do not own the data. We are custodians of data, which is provided to us, which are provided to us by external and other parties uh, for the sake of using it in the conservation world. So the global approach of IT in order to support our conservation, because we have one planet and we have to conserve one planet and every part of the planet are linked together. We went with this approach as much global as possible, as local as necessary, which I think is used in many organizations. Uh, the benefit of this is really we increase collaboration. We have really now global processes for compliance and we have cost efficient support for all our users worldwide. We have implemented follow the sun and we also enable through so this process is to have support in every part of the world where we operate. We have, we don't have need to have everybody in, I call the West. We can have everybody in IT support across the world. So we implemented a lot of global solutions. We left nearly nothing locally. Uh, so we first started with a global governance. Uh, in the past projects were really uh, set up with the person uh, I would say shouting the most. We came with a more governance, which is aligned with the project, with the uh, organization's priorities. We also align all our back office secretary application, finance, ERP, HRMS projects, etc. We also realign all our global constituents. So our constituents in IUCN are basically the council, the commissions, and the members. And so we implemented the CRM, which for us C is the constituent relationship management, and also specialized systems for serving these constituents. And we went global. So a member is one member with one unique member number reference worldwide. We also uh, implemented the infrastructure to support that, a global network, including one optimization to reduce power usage, global firewall for increasing security. We move into global data centers and we had two, both one on premise, one on cloud, and we remove local servers. We also standardized end user computing and we implemented the global ticketing system. And this is really was a big improvement. So we can focus all our users worldwide on what they know and do most is conserving nature. This is just for reference, how we move the organization. You find the global CIO, sometimes uh, other CIOs like to see uh, how organizations are done. I report to the deputy director general in charge of corporate services, but also I have the IS steering committee, which are, mem which are members are uh, members of the executive board and other part of the organization. And then I have three components in my organization, uh, infrastructure, back office system, and also uh, what I call union application, which are system and application for our constituents, as well as for the public. So what are the unique IS challenges for IUCN? One of the big ones which surprised me when I arrived is we really, really have remote offices. And in this case, we have different challenges, especially compared to other organizations I've been before. As you have listed before, I was in pharma, in, uh, in spirits, in food, they were generally having office in big, look, in big cities. There we have offices in cities 
or even in national parks. So the stability and reliability of network power, etc., was uh, was very uh, challenging. We also have regularly physical damage on site. It could be by biodiversity, like animals, but also nature. We got everything since I arrived: earthquakes, typhoons, etc. We also have rampage in some places. And then we have all these challenges to bring equipment in these remote areas of the world. And finding IT specialized people is also a challenge. And we have 17 hours time zone between, I would say, the first office who opened just now in Fiji. It's already next day for them. Uh, and uh, San Jose is just having opened in Costa Rica. So we have 17 hours to cover. And of course, as we are uh, funded with donations, we have small team and small budgets, especially on each side. At the bottom, I just show you a few things. Uh, we got interesting uh, fiber cable eaten by baboons in our Kenya office. We had a rampage of our Wagadugu office, and then the shipment of new switches uh, arriving in our Fiji uh, office. So. These are unique challenges. Now we also can say we turned these challenges into an advantage. And I think this is how you need to be positive. Uh, solving our remote offices challenges, we implemented riverbed technologies for one and for uh, no more local servers to remove backup patching operations locally. And it allows also offices to work uh, even when the network is down and the synchronization occurs when the connection is back. For that, we implemented OneDrive from Microsoft uh, to allow for that. That was a big, uh, a big improvement for the people locally. We also, as I mentioned, we use common configuration of, of uh, equipment. We use only laptops. So we, we, in case of power downtime, people can continue working on their batteries. And uh, they can even take it at home in case of disaster and so on. We also have implemented Microsoft Direct Access, which allows direct VPN connectivity. Uh, so people get directly luck at the office, even when they are home or when they are anywhere, you know, as soon as they have an internet uh, connection. This is also allowing to distribute security and operating system patches. This has really improved the reliability of our network. We also ensure that all our global applications I mentioned before were accessible from the internet and some for security reason via only via Microsoft remote desktop. And we had implemented business, Skype for business since 2014 and has been widely used since then. So we don't rely on local landlines we only rely on the internet connection. That can be in some country, you be using 3G and 4G. In some countries, these 3G and 4G are more available than landlines. And then what happened is this implementation that was made to make our office, uh, how do you say, resilient, it turned into a huge advantage when COVID-19 COVID arrived. Why? Because we were planning originally a scenario of one office can be done at, at any time. But the setup, in fact, allowed as well that all offices are done and everybody work from home. Uh, in fact, everybody was already trained on using offline and uh, working from home. And so when the mandate to stay at home came in, there was no impact on this on our staff. They were all already equipped. And this challenge of being in remote locations, having all these issues basically turn into an advantage for us. It also enforced the digitalization of the staff. I use just the example of DocuSign. We implemented DocuSign two years before COVID, but it was slow to come up because even if we are a conservation organization, people like paper still. But after people were trained on it, so as soon as COVID arrived, everybody started using DocuSign and it has become now a standard, even if some offices are returning to work from the office, some people are 
returning. And we just increased, uh, how do you say, improved the team, the Sky for Business by logically upgraded to Teams, but people were already used to use Skype for Business with a bit less quality and some connectivity issues, but Teams was seen as a big advantage moving forward. <laughs> the second unique challenge that we have is we are complex for our size, as you have seen a little bit in the uh, explanation of the organization. And this complexity, uh, of course, uh, is reflected in IT. The first one, and as you know, I mean, we, we have to operate in multiple languages. Hopefully we standardize on three, which are English, French, and Spanish. But the challenge is everything has to be delivered in those three languages. So it's a challenge each time we have to develop an application. We as IT, Secretariat IT people, we control only the Secretariat equipment. So it's about 1,000 staff. But all the others, like the 18,000 commission members, or the councillors, or the members, we have no control of the IT equipment. So we, it forces us to make sure we develop systems for them which are very flexible. We also have complexities in our membership. We have four categories of members split into two chambers. The first chamber is for government and government agencies. And the second chamber is for NGOs and indigenous people organizations. And these different members have different voting rights and different rights. And all of that is, has to be taken into account when we vote, when we communicate to them, when the result of the vote is uh, made uh, available. Now, motions, voting on motion is public. So uh, if the British government votes on a specific motion, their vote is made public. We, you can see everything they voted in the motions. So for in Marseille, two weeks ago, we voted, there was a motion to uh, moratory on deep sea mining. You can go on the Congress website and see how British organization and British government voted. Now, the other election we have is secret, is the election of our council members is secret, uh, but it applies to the same category of people. But the voters, because it's secret, are not the same as the one voting in public. And the majority is required in those two chambers. It's just a small thing, but it creates a lot of complexities. And also made that, for example, we look for a year for a package for e-voting and we could not find one. So a lot of things has, have to be developed in-house to ensure we follow uh, our rules and our statuses. These statuses can only be changed during a member's assembly. So we are not very agile in this sense. So only every four years, like a few things were voted in the last two weeks, and now we have four years to implement them, <clears throat> and they will be launched at the next Congress, so in four years. So the timelines are very sometimes slow. Uh, so uh, the agility of the organization in terms of its statuses is slow. Uh, the other thing is every donor can impose their own rules and policies. And this has lead, this is leading to major complexities. I just mentioned here in the timesheet for staff, we have 14 dimensions due to all the requirements of every or each donor, which are different. Uh, we also have, and it's interesting part, we are continuously audited because donors are government and so taxpayers require audits. And so the Swedish, the Norway, the American, the French, they all come to get uh, to audit what we do, what we do in their projects, what we do as an organization, how we manage procurement, for example. Uh, donor contracts cannot be standardized uh, because individual reporting is required the way we pay people is different. Sometimes they include travel expense, sometimes it's not, et cetera. And so everyone is uh, different. So it's a lot of complexities. We also, I mentioned, we audited. There is a strong need for transparency of our activities and results. 
So we have recently adopted the IATA, IAT, sorry, IAT standards, which is uh, International Aid Transparency Initiative, IAT. And it's a way to report for all organizations like us. And now we try to report only in YATI uh, format and not uh, trying to convert some donors to accept this format. <clears throat> and the last of our complexity, one of our complexity is many of our knowledge tools are managed not only by us, by a consortium of organizations. While, for example, the red list of threatened species is IUCN managed, uh, from an uh, organization part. It's a consortium which has BirdLife, we have cons the Conservation International, we have a lot of organizations who have something to say. So it's again not easy, sometimes not agile, and especially in IT when some of these organizations need to agree on tools that need to be uh, used. So it's all complexity, but again, uh, we try to take them into an advantage. Uh, so because we have this internal complexity, we basically decided to create a global system architecture uh, based on a very core master data and a lot of satellite individual systems by functional areas. This is really allowing us to be very flexible, to have a reporting the way people want, and also to ensure that all the dimension of every donor, every member can be included. This is especially valid for finance, uh, for constituent relationship management, and for project management. And then part of this, because we have a core master data and all this system, we came with, of course, the one owner of the data component with a common taxonomy. Uh, we created a global data warehouse for the reporting. <coughs> All our systems are now multilingual, and we have also a common taxonomy in every language. So we have a common dictionary for every term we use. And we made, I mentioned, all applications accessible from the internet, because we don't know at the end who is the customer. And all our content management was put into a single uh, a standard content management based on Drupal. And the benefits and the advantage is it allows for very fast answer to changing requirements. I mentioned quick uh, already timesheets. We developed a timesheet system because we had nearly all the data already. It came, we had data in project management in HR, and it was the timesheet basically is to collect this information and post directly into finance, which is an approval process. We also move our project management tool, and for transparency, we publish in our open project portal, all our projects. Of course, we require donor approvals and so on, but due to the fact we had a modular approach, this uh, request, which came uh, from, uh, from a member's assembly, was we were able to fulfill very quickly. Uh, same thing in Marseille, it was voted to create a new commission. Now we have a commission systems and we can just add a new commission. It doesn't require, we have all the processes already in place, just a name and a few uh, a specific process for the new commission. And in four year time now it will be, but we can go even faster. And we also develop a union portal to, oops, to address communication to uh, our different visitors. And this is very flexible. Uh, it's tailored to the type of the visitors. We also uh, allow continuous up-to-date data so we have always, we can show and display. I'm not saying real time because in our business, we are at the speed of nature. So real time is nearly a month's update, but still uh, we, uh, a member can always see uh, their billing status because the finance status is, pro is basically displayed in the union portal. And we therefore implemented on the union portal for members, the ability to pay with credit card which was a big improvement for, small of this, for some of the small organization. All members use the common login, which is managed by us. They don't need to have a Google or Facebook. We manage their login. And we also use standard tool like S3 for GIS. So the latest portal, which will come in November, is called Contribution for Nature. And it basically show what our members 
where and what our members are doing in the world. We just pull from existing systems and basically show the data to the public in a GIS tool from S3. So we have become a very flexible, and this is again helping a lot uh, how do you, to, uh, to display and help with understanding nature conservation. We still have IS challenges like everybody, of course, and I basically uh, want to, uh, to finish uh, with this is uh, uh, budget is always an issue. We have a very flex flexible funding, I would say, but the problem with this flexible funding is we face inflexibility in many of our cloud vendors. And so we are very careful uh, with what we do with cloud. Uh, as, as soon as we don't have the money, uh, these cloud vendors, they shut down your, your accesses. And that could be a challenge for us. Uh, we are working on a new approach. We hope uh, that it will work. It will basically uh, be presented next week. And uh, we are trying to use a model as like desktop as a service where basically all IT costs are included into the price of a workstation per uh, employee. And it's more transparent for donors and for many uh, part of the organization. Uh, we still have, like many organizations I work, an old culture, to, which I call it sit on my data. People don't like to place their information in the cloud or uh, even in a corporate data center. They want to have it in their computer. And, uh, but hopefully we are breaking this. The new workforce is aware of this. Uh, and so it's something that, uh, uh, that we are moving, but keeping also historical data due to the sit on my data, when people leave after project closure, we often do not keep the data used to uh, run the project and come to the publication, which is at the closure of the project. Uh, we also have, I mentioned compliance with donors. We do not own the data, we are custodian. And uh, in this case, a lot of our data cannot be used commercially. And sometimes it conflict with some cloud vendors where they say they want to mine your information to provide you with some advertising or other offerings. So we always have to be very careful, but we can transform that again into potential opportunities. And of course, green IT, I mentioned that is it in it. It's in our core, and we are still focusing little by little to remove our energy hungry uh, processes. And of course, there are many other opportunities that we will explore. It's not finished, and uh, the organization is changing after Congress, uh, and we'll use this new organization to reduce complexity and change the culture. Uh, we also have event linked to end of life of current, some of our current tools. And so we are using that as opportunity also to rethink how we are uh, organized. We still do not uh, implement well uh, innovative IT solution within our own projects uh, because the project funds, they want to uh, deploy on the ground, not in technology system. It is changing. Uh, we are starting partnership with some startups, but we have funding issues, they have. But uh, we are, for example, working with a company called Pictera for satellite image uh, recognition of objects with artificial intelligence. It helps. Uh, but uh, interestingly enough, in innovative solution, because of our, uh, how do you say, our uh, process uh, and our compliance, we have a procurement process and we need often to have three offers, but sometime working with a startup, we are only have one. So we have to work around these small issues. Uh, GIS is still not, it's big use, but it's not widely used. We are working on that. We just created a GIS competence center with S3. Like I mentioned, Marseille demonstrated that <coughs> we can do efficiently hybrid events. We used to have a lot of face-to-face uh, -face events, but uh, we discovered that requires dedicated resource, etc. 
Now we are working to find, oops, sorry, to increase our tool sets, our teams, uh, and increase with how do you get virtual spaces, even like Second Life and things like that. And of course, continue green IT as part of our walk the talk. So I will stop here. Thanks a lot for your attention. I hope it was interesting and useful. Uh, I leave here time for questions uh, and uh, also my contact if some people want to reach to me directly. So I'm open for questions now. Thanks a lot. Well, that is really amazing, Francois. The number of dimensions you covered, the, the number of aspects of technology that you're using, and all for natural causes. It's just mind blowing, I'd say. What do other people say? Do you have comments or questions from Francois in terms of this incredible amount of work that he and his organization are doing? Please ask them now if you can. David, would you like to uh, field the questions? I can see one from Carol right now. It's a comment, but David, over to you. Uh, are we going to hand over to Santana briefly? Um, let's just tackle one or two questions if there are any. If not, then we'll move to Santana. Okay, so David Lewis uh, comments. When you see the complexity, they are, do they are doing a great job. Well done. Uh, there's lots of moving parts in this. Thank you. We've got a message from Karen. A really important organization and the wonderful and necessary work you do. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, let's come back to questions later. Meanwhile, another aspect of all this, but it all ties up, of course, is going to be presented by our colleague Santana, Santana Lewis, who is our within the Central and North London branches. For so Santana, over to you. Give us your thoughts. Yes, thank you, Francois, for the informative talk. Good evening, everybody. I will aim in the next five minutes or so to give you a taste during this great big green week as to why minimizing is e-waste should be a priority. Why is 2021 a super year for the climate and the environment? And where do we fit in? 2021 is a critical year for tackling the climate emergency at COP20, at, 20, at the 26th UN Climate Change Conference, COP26, but is also paramount for the wider sustainability agenda. Ahead of those meetings, it is our responsibility as ICT professionals to do our part to implement sustainable practices in our homes, workplaces, businesses, and petition our government for better e-waste management systems and legislation, legislation. We must act now as time is not on our side. The manufacturing of electronic devices and the use of rare metals materials that, that uh, go into their productive represent into their production represent a huge source of embodied energy minimizing e-waste helps to conserve resources and reduces the amount of energy we take from the earth discarded devices often con contain a range of chemicals that are harmful to the environment such as mercury and lead making it it's important to discard them correctly, being mindful of using landfills in developing countries for child labor, as has been documented in some parts of the world. <clears throat> the average UK household creates 55 kilograms of e-waste each year. The, the equivalent weight of 20 22-inch computer, computer monitors. Out of 39 countries surveyed in Europe where, where data was available, the UK is the second worst offender, beaten only by Norway. In 2019, 53.6 million tons of electronic waste was produced globally, according to statistics from the UN. 
E-waste when treated inadequately poses serious health issues since it contains hazardous components which contaminates air, water and soil, putting people's health at risk. Dismantling processes that do not have adequate facilities and training staff pose additional threats to population and the planet. These issues are addressed by the United Nations listed Sustainable Development Goals. Solutions include durable product design, buyback and return systems for used electronics, urban mining to extract metals and materials from e-waste, and by replacing outright device ownership with rental and leasing models in order to maximize product reuse and recycling opportunities. <clears throat> Examples of technology that are improving the sustainability development goals include advances in technology, AI, blockchain, sensors, and biotechnology. Here are six simple ways to consider regarding minimizing e-waste. You may be already aware of them. One, reevaluate. Do you really need that extra gadget? Try finding one device with multiple functions. <clears throat> Two, extend the life of your electronics. Buy a case, keep your device clean, and av avoid overcharging the battery. Three, buy environmentally friendly electronics. Look for products labeled Energy Star or certified by the Electronic Product Environmental Assessment Tool, EPIT. Four, donate used electronics to social programs and help victims of domestic violence and, and environmental causes, etc. Five, reuse large electronics and fix recycle electronics and batteries in council recycling centers or deliver to charities. A, use, a useful website is www.recycleyourelectricals.org.uk. A final comment for any of your entrepreneurs who have been energized and motivated by the current climate crisis and want to act. Have you heard of the Earthshot Prize? The Earthshot Prize is a 50 million fund to find solutions for managing environmental challenges. One million prizes will go to green projects each year for the next decade in five categories, including one on reducing waste. So let us all play our individual part for the sake of our future, the generations to come, and our beautiful and precious planet Earth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam Turman. Well, there we are. We've heard some very different views about, e about our eco theme. But I want to ask Francois a question, if I may. And Francois, you have collated the efforts of very diverse peoples around the globe, but surely a lot of them said, I don't want to do this with computers. Why should we use computers at all? How did you treat that question? How did you manage to computerize and standardize, or, uh, uh, digi digitally standardize all of this work? And surely a lot of impetus was not to have any computerization at all. So uh, thanks, Dalim. It's it's a very valid question. Uh, in many parts of the world, it's computers are seen potentially even of polluting, uh, how do you say, devices. And, but today, uh, people can see that, in fact, uh, like I mentioned, a lot of, if you don't use computers, a lot of processes uh, are using much more energy or much more natural resources. So we came from this approach. Uh, again, green IT was a big eye opener for many people. 
standardizing if you use poorly built computers if you lose uh, computers using uh, materials which are sourced from Congo or from children mines and so on uh, because they are cheap uh, this is not correct so we went from this approach of in fact we can be more efficient and all the money we save uh, on the efficiency can be basically returned directly for conserving nature instead of uh, having in inefficient processes or cutting a lot of trees or extracting uh, bad materials so it requires quite some how do you say education but also more and more uh, universities are teaching uh, students about all these matters and they come more open uh, with this uh, with uh, this mindset of uh, at the end of the day if you have the right computer if you use the right IT resource you also can save the planet it's not only uh, resource intensive but you need to be careful uh, we for example source here in each, each quarter, all our energy from solar. We have solar panels on the roof. We also use the heat of the data center to preheat the hot water for bathrooms, kitchen. And so we, are implement, we have implemented quite a lot of uh, all around the world uh, processes that show that uh, uh, IT is not only a waste, but can be reused and can be contributing to the preservation of nature. I hope I answer your question. Yes, indeed. And I think it probably takes us further along the arguments that Santana has made as well. Santana, what do you think in terms of the recommendations that you have made about some of the things that the I Francois and the IUCN are doing on a global scale to use computing in an energy efficient way? Um, yes, I, I think uh, what uh, Francois pointed, pointed out there that um, the minerals that have been extracted, the problem right now is the extraction process uh, is a big problem. So we need to make sure that uh, when we procure these uh, electronic devices that we are asking the questions from our suppliers and the vendors, are they using um, sort of the, the circular economy. So when this life cycle of this equipment is going to end in three years, will those electronics be reused again for repurposing or reused in other projects, for example, rather than ending up in, in landfills? So uh, as you know, when uh, electronic ends in landfills, it could pollute uh, the oceans, it could pollute uh, the rivers because what happens is during time all the water seeps and you get mercury and lead and other minerals that are uh, leading to uh, bad health in the end. So we, we try and mitigate these uh, things by uh, asking these questions uh, at the beginning from our vendors and making sure that all our vendors are now, uh, for example, I read that Apple is, is now trying to use 100% of the rare uh, earth materials uh, that are going to be recycled in, in some of their uh, new phones that are going to be coming out. So that's one example that uh, I can see that most of these big uh, manufacturers are thinking about e-waste and the environment and the pollution they're causing. I, I can add a little bit on it as well because uh, we use a company, an organization called TCO Certified, uh, which is a Swedish organization which helps us select not only the computers, but also, you know, your switch and all the other devices to ensure that they are produced uh, in, an, in a good way. And we also uh, use an organization at the end of the cycle, on the other side of the cycle, it's called Close the Gap, it's based in Brussels. And they reuse the computers. Uh, they send, of course, to third, some of the third world or developing countries. But they also ensure that they are used in a, how do you say, in a good way. And at the end of their life cycle, the, the parts are recycled. 
So uh, we got certification at the entry into our organization as well as the exit. And so uh, our computers, we also have increased a lot the life of our computers. Uh, in commercial organization, I had computers lasting three years. Uh, we journey now we have a five year cycle and some computer can last six to seven years today. And so we're extending the life of these computers, which also uh, reduce the number of new computers uh, we can we buy. But we place in our request, in our procurement process, we place requirements from all the suppliers that they need to ensure to us that the computer is made properly, but also the packaging material is made properly and everything around the manuals. We don't want the manuals because we don't need the manuals. And we need to have many other things that we are looking to make sure we do things uh, in the proper way. Uh, we also ask our cloud providers that we are hosted in data centers that are green, that, are, that get electric, electrical from uh, green sources, etc., etc. So we have a lot of requirements that we ask from our suppliers. And we do due diligence with every one of our supplier to ensure that, uh, I'll say to be majority of the time sure, that uh, we again walk the talk. So uh, this is really uh, it's really a key part. It's not only the usage, it's what you said, it's the whole life cycle. I think, I think there are a lot of things we can learn. Uh, many of our organizations here in the UK can learn from some of your ideas, Francois. Um, but there's a question I noticed from Ken Spence, who says, he's obviously got his eyes on the money because he said, what about Bitcoin mining? And uh, possibly we may need Ken to elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, David, is it possible to unmute Ken to ask for more clarification about that question? Yes. Um... Ken, would you like to tell us more? What about Bitcoin mining? What's wrong with Bitcoin mining? Well, um, can you hear me, uh, folks? Yes, it's great. Yes, I'm, I'm just, I get through the media, the news media, the BBC included, that Bitcoin mining is extremely expensive in the way that it uh, ratifies things over blockchain and so forth, to the expense of using an awful lot of electricity, mm -hmm. requiring an awful lot of computers to support it, and which computers which having to increase their power have to be replaced quite frequently. So it seems to be a big drain on us. Is that so? Would you agree? Uh, for, for me, I've been involved a bit into this because one of the projects wanted to use not Bitcoins, but another, uh, another of these uh, virtual monies. Uh, and uh, we look at it and indeed, it's really, really uh, energy, how do you say, angry. Uh, this is crazy. When you look at some of these, the number of, the amount of electricity, the power required for each transaction is crazy. So it's definitely something currently we have not embraced this part, Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of these. Uh, we had a pilot, we studied it, and we say due, through your, your due diligence that it was not aligned with our values. So currently we are not using this, uh, this process. But I think there are a few people, especially here in Switzerland, in near Zug, in the, what they call the crypto valley, they are looking at ways to uh, reduce uh, the power needed to to do this mining, but currently it's definitely not where you want to go. Okay, well, it is something which will gain in popularity. So are you, uh, are you actually falling behind the, uh, the progress that it's making or the impact that it's, it's making? Yeah, but if progress is to destroy environment, that is exactly what we don't mm. want. So we need yeah, to be careful. Right. Yeah, okay, thank you. Absolutely. Well, David, I think you have some questions there from Margaret, Margaret Ross. Yes, I'll just um, offer to unmute. And Margaret is from the Green IT Specialist Group, amongst others. 
He is very, very much a key figure in the BCA. Welcome, Margaret. Hi. I, um, I can't put this, my camera on, but uh, hopefully I've unmuted. I was wondering how can you persuade companies to actually think about rechanging their design? Um, and obviously this is going to be very expensive because there's the whole of the tooling process uh, so that their new products, mobile phones, computers, etc., could be actually disassembled easily. And anybody wants an upgrade instead of having to buy a new phone, etc., you just take it in and then replace certain parts and hand it back. Um, now, this would obviously be a tremendous saving, but I can see that this would be extremely unpopular uh, with manufacturers. So how can we persuade manufacturers to do this? And how can we persuade the general public instead of starting off with what does this product do and how much is it? It's can it be disassembled? And can I have the upgrade within uh, purchasing a new one? And now, what does it do and how much does it cost? Thank you. Some of these are very much in line with Santana's questions as well. So, Francois and Santana, do you have, uh, do you have observations on that question? Uh, I have a quick observation. That's, it's an interesting question because we, we, we propose to our employees standard phones and we introduce in our standards the fair phone i don't know if some people know the fair phone it's a, exactly what you describe it's a phone that can be repaired can be upgraded etc but these devices have become so personal that uh, having a fair phone was not attractive it's heavy it's not powerful enough uh, etc etc so even I would say the best conservationist remains, unfortunately, I would say they remain uh, human beings and they like to have a practical tool to carry on them. And so this is a major challenge. So I think the, the, the push by iPhone currently, what uh, Santana was mentioning, I think the main vendors who are trendy, these are the ones that needs to change uh, because all the entries in this field have, I would say, kind of failed. Uh, because there is a concept of personal, let's say it's a personal device, it's a, it's a personal status symbol, and it's very difficult for many people to change. So I don't know, Santana, what's your opinion, but we, we fail as an IS department to push this type of devices. People are okay getting a, a computer which can be repaired like we do, but the phone, they are really strict with the phone. They want a light, small, trendy phone. Yes, I, <clears throat> I agree with uh, all, all the comments. Um, and that's why in one of the um, suggestions I was making is we, we need to ask ourselves, do we need that uh, extra gadget and do we need to renew it every two years and so on? And I think a lot of, uh, technology companies have now embraced the uh, design for the environment principles. And these are principles that look into sustainability, working with, um, with uh, uh, technologies, with chemists and uh, with environmentalists to, to design their products from uh, packaging to the actual uh, extraction of the minerals for making the products. And uh, what they are trying to do is from some of these e-waste that is uh, produced using, during the uh, processing. They are actually trying now to work with the chemists to make um, uh, more components that will last longer from these rare uh, elements that we use. So there's a lot of research going on in those areas that uh, we were seeing that uh, have been used. And I think it's down to personal individuals to sort of look at these um, energy star criteria and the EPIT to see that uh, their uh, electronic devices are meeting the, um, the standards that uh, we need to protect our environment. And um, lastly, I think a lot of, uh, um, it's, all, it's all about changing the behaviors uh, and, and, um, and it's always a difficult thing. So I think the behavior needs to change personally at home 
in our workplaces and businesses. And then it's a conversation that we should be having with all kinds of uh, people, professionals, to, to, to make this uh, uh, environment uh, sustainable in the future. Could I come back on that for a moment? Um, I think that I was looking at some new phones on the internet and I was fascinated to see just how many different colors you could have the phones in. So in other words, they're not only encouraging to purchase, maybe rather sooner than necessary, but it's actually becoming a fashion statement. So once you start actually saying you can have your phone in any color you like, your laptop in any color you like, it's going to actually increase the sort of the, the fashion turnover element of it, which is very much against what we're all trying to do. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Um, Francois, do you have any comment about that? No, I would say that I mean, there's a proliferation of equipment and uh, it comes in all because we talk about the phone, we don't see the watches. Uh, electronic watches, which have even a shorter cycle, and uh, many of the other equipment that you have around you uh, is becoming, uh, how do you say, on very very short cycle, and then this equipment ends up in the in the water, and as was mentioned, start to pollute because uh, it's how do you say it's uh, throwable, and uh, even in I would say in countries like here in Switzerland where we try to get everything clean. In fact, most countries sell the waste to other countries where the people who buy the waste supposedly to treat it, basically drop it uh, into the, the river and you find it after into the sea. And uh, we have major projects in place currently for this plastic leakage, but which has been extended to this uh, rare materials and others uh, leakage from uh, the rivers into the sea uh, and uh, trying to find out what is the trend at the root cause, what the root cause is. And through a commission on education and communication, we also trying to educate the young generation that uh, it requires nearly a generation to change. But it's really, uh, how do you stop demand is somehow the main uh, way to stop it. And uh, this, this commission part of IUCN is, is very big on, on that. We do this stopping demand as a strategy in many places, also for the commercial usage of animals or vegetables. It's how do you stop demand for pangolin scales? How do you stop the demand for, for rare rosewood? Uh, it's the same. At the end, it's the same. You don't want all these things to end up uh, either being killed or being in the leakage. So it's, it's a long, it will take at least a generation. And that's why our organization work with plans like uh, Nature 2030 or Plan 2050, because it requires a generation for many of these changes to really happen in the mind of the people. But it starts to come. You see the young generation, I'm surprised, I don't want cars. I don't know how it is in the UK, but here in Switzerland, at my time, when you were 18, you wanted a car. And now I see the friends having kids, or even my kids, it's not their dream to have a car at 18. So there is a change, there's a very strong change. And I think we are getting there. It just requires a bit of time. Wise, wise observations. Well, you mentioned something which I will just pick on. And that is, if I could just share my screen for, for a moment, you will see that uh, our next event, in fact, in two days time on Friday, is going to be looking at the pollution and water quality of the oceans, specifically about the Atlantic, because we have a project which is for a AI powered um, autom an automated vessel. Basically, I suppose you could call it a robot. Uh, and that's going to go across the Atlantic and is going to test the water, the air, lots of environmental and, um, and uh, physics, uh, physical and chemical aspects 
as it goes across the Atlantic, but it's powered by AI and by robotics. So that's going to be on Friday, and I do hope that you will all come to that. Um, uh, and additionally, you can risk your life, <laughs> you could say, by not just watching it on, as a webinar, or as the catch-up video that we will produce, but coming in person. So this will be the first in-person event that we have in all, more than one and a half years. And it's on this Friday, it's going to be at BCS London, do come. But let me just go back to asking Francois something else, if I may. And that is, uh, and I'm struggling to do that where I should be, but maybe I'll give up with that. <laughs> uh, uh, Francois, the IUCN is a little known body in relation to the importance of its work. I'll put that to you as, a, uh, as an idea, but you must be represented, for example, at COP26 and so on. What can we, each of us, say to our MPs or our government about what we need to do for the world and the future of the world. Do you have any ideas? Uh, I'm asking you to be Greta Thunberg, I guess. <laughs> uh, do you, what should we be saying? Can you think of any phrases or uh, things for us to say to powerful people around us and to the people who will be at COP26? I mean, I'm, I'm CIO, I'm an IT guy, so uh, I'm not sometimes too much involved but in, this, uh, in the details. But what I can see is if all the motions that have been approved by IUCN, which are now resolutions, because the motion approved is called a resolution, if all the resolutions can be implemented by governments uh, in all parts of the world, that would be a great, great uh, improvement to the world. Uh, and that's, for example, that 30% of the marine uh, areas of each country is protected, especially from fisheries. Uh, this is a big one. And uh, also if uh, we stop trading uh, uh, how do you say, endangered species. And many of these things, uh, which are in IUCN resolutions that can be seen from our website. Uh, and you can pick the one you prefer, I would say, uh, because not all are applicable to the UK, but uh, all these resolutions which have been voted and approved uh, by uh, all the IUCN constituents, are, if they can be applied, the world will be a better world. Okay. Could I sort of add in, uh, I think if I was speaking to my MP, I'd try and persuade them about all the marvelous money they think they could make out of mining the e-waste and try to sort of uh, attract them to the, the possible financial benefits of effectively uh, taking a greener view. Yeah, we, we are also, uh, I think it's Margaret who talk. Uh, we're also embarking in something called the natural capital coalition is how you treat the nat nature like the stock market. So if you invest in it and, it's, and if the nature increase, then the value of your stock increases. And there is a big uh, approach there which will make people interested in basically investing in the protection of nature. And this is something which is basically using similar tools as stock market, but for the benefit of nature. It's, uh, you can see more again on our website and the Natural Capital Coalition. Well, that's another fantastic idea. Santana, I'm going to task you with something, please. And that is to liaise further with um, Francois. He's given us a whistle stop tour, a very fast tour through an amazing complexity of points and actions and possibilities relating to nature and our environment. 
the IUCN clearly has global, has global powers or influence, we need to increase the influence of organizations like the IUCN. But let me just say, we need to increase the IUCN's, not, um, uh, the knowledge of the IUCN and what it does. I think it's doing brilliant work. You have shown us so many complexities there, Francois. I congratulate you and your team on what you're doing. And for the purposes of this evening, I would like to say thank you very, very much for being with us. We will see you again, I know. And that's not just for your beautiful backdrop. <laughs> okay. Francois, thank thanks a lot. You so much. And happy to host anyone if they come to Switzerland and if you're interested in this topic. Yes, and, and uh, thank, thank you very much. You also mentioned uh, something about ocean mining, Francois. So uh, yes. this is something that uh, you have to be very mindful. As you know, everybody has seen the pictures of rare, rare earth uh, mining that's going on and the destruction that's happening around the world. So if you're going to now go into our oceans, we have to be very mindful how that sort of mining is is going to take place. And you mentioned that uh, the UK is involved, so we look into that and yes. see how we can work together. It's, uh, to it's motion 069 of the previous Congress, and you can see the text that was approved. Yeah, and it's probably something we, we probably need to campaign with our local MPs here in the UK about that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we can uh, do a little petition or something. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank have you. Have a nice well, evening. Yeah, well, tonight we have seen about the environment, about species, whether they are animal species or uh, whether they're plant species. And then on Friday, I hope you'll join us. And Francois, this is you too, if you'd like to, because we'll be looking at the oceans and the Mayflower Voyage of Discovery. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. See you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.